Tonight, the rollout of the grocery rebate, a one-time payment leaving some shoppers hungry for more. The challenge at the checkout counter. For us, that's going to cover about four weeks. As the cost of living keeps climbing. I think there's a lot of Canadians struggling right now. Ontario investigators solve a cold case from 1975. We were able to trace the relatives, the DNA relatives. A missing woman identified and a man accused of murder. Plus, a different kind of antiques roadshow. You can't be in a hurry. You have to be appreciative of the machine. Vintage wheels for a worthy cause. A historic ride across Manitoba. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. An estimated 11 million Canadians started receiving some relief today from the shock of soaring food prices. But those who are digesting the financial impact warn the one-time grocery rebate is only a short-term fix. While inflation has dropped to 3.4 percent, food prices are up 9 percent from last year leading to a surge of people using food banks nationwide. CTV's Judy Trin breaks down the new boost for shoppers with a reality check at the checkout. Grocery rebates, while welcome, won't fill up much of this cart. It just makes it easier for us for a short amount of time, and that's nice, but it's not going to make a dent in the long run. Norma Quibble, a working mom with two kids, earns $32,000 a year. She's among the close to 30% of Canadians the federal government is aiming to help. People who qualify for the GST credit are getting the one-time grocery rebate. It varies between $234 for a single person to $628 for families with four kids. The grocery rebate will provide some important breathing space at a time when people really need it. The problem isn't going away. Food costs are projected to rise 7% this year. That means Canadians will pay an estimated $1,000 more for groceries. When they can't make ends meet, many show up at food banks, which are bracing for another 60% increase in clients. The lineups are getting longer. Food is getting harder and harder to access. And the, the most challenging part is it's healthy food. So getting the nutrients that you need is harder and harder for people to get. This grocery rebate gives Quibble extra money to buy food for her family in July. But rent and groceries eat up 90% of her income, and she's sinking deeper into credit card debt. It's a lot of juggling around and making sure that, like, the important things like having a roof over our head and food is taken care of before we do anything else. Experts say a long-term strategy is needed to keep Canadians from falling into poverty, and that includes making housing more affordable, not just giving grocery rebates. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. And you can go to our website for more details about who qualifies for the rebate and the range of payments. That's at ctvnews.ca. The business of building a battery plant for electric vehicles is starting up again in Windsor, Ontario. Stellantis and LG reached a deal with Ottawa and Ontario to match the funding that plant would have been offered in the U.S. The automaker says we are pleased that the federal government, with the support of the provincial government, came back and met their commitment of leveling the playing field. CTV's Travis Fortnum joins us now from Windsor. And Travis, likely many people there breathing a significant sigh of relief tonight. Yeah, Omar, 54 days, seven weeks of anxiety. And just like that tonight, the company's confirming a deal has been reached. Many here have been biting their nails watching this all unfold, some of whom probably thought this was a done deal a year ago when the plant was announced. All that called into question after Stellantis hit the brakes. Many suspect after hearing how much money the federal government offered Volkswagen for a comparable plant in St. Thomas, Ontario. I caught up with Windsor's mayor shortly after word broke tonight. He characterizes this seven-week stalemate as a national embarrassment for the city and says now a weight's been lifted. Let's look forward to the future, and that's the, the finalizing of construction, getting that plant open, getting it fitted inside, getting 3,000 people hired. 
You heard the mayor there. Thousands of jobs expected to be created by the EV battery plant itself, with thousands more in spin-off jobs anticipated for Windsor's economy. Hiring at the plant was expected to start later this year, with the plant initially expected to open in 2024. We'll just have to see if this seven-week pause has pushed that back any. Omar. All right, CTV's Travis Fordham in Windsor tonight. Travis, thank you. Tensions between some tech giants in Ottawa are growing deeper tonight, with the federal government announcing it will stop advertising on Instagram and Facebook. The fight is over a controversial law that would force Meta and Google to pay for Canadian news stories shared on their platforms. Instead, the companies are threatening to avoid Canadian news altogether. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. With Meta blocking news to some Canadians, the federal government is retaliating by suspending ads on Facebook and Instagram. We are not backing down on this. This goes to the core of a free and informed society. Meta is promising to remove news for Canadians on its platforms to protest the Online News Act, a new law that will require Silicon Valley giants Facebook and Google to share revenues with Canadian news organizations. Today we're calling on both platforms to st stay at the table, work through the regulatory process with us, contribute their fair share. Quebec-based media companies Cogeco and Quebecor followed the federal government's lead and Premier Francois Legault pulled government publicity from Meta platforms saying no business is above the law. It's pretty clear. It is a showdown. The gloves are off. And I think the federal government is putting a stance and saying, well, wait a second, if you're not going to negotiate with us, we're going to hit you where it hurts. Though Meta might not feel the sting after earning more than $116 billion in revenue last year, while the Canadian government paid $11 million for ads on Facebook and Instagram. But some experts say Meta is worried about being on the hook for far more if other countries draft similar laws. We're talking about potential billions of dollars in terms of liability for linking to news. While Google is also threatening to block Canadian news content, the company is negotiating with the government. Meta is not. That company defended its position. Publishers actively choose to post on Facebook and Instagram because it benefits them to do so. Though some provinces, including Ontario, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, will continue to run ads on meta platforms, Omar, the Liberal Party of Canada will as well. All right, Kevin, thank you. We learned today that yesterday was the hottest day ever on the planet. Temperature records that are even being shattered here at home as millions continue to sizzle in a heat wave. It's all happening during El Nino. CTV's Heather Butts on the climate wild card and its potential impact on Canada. In Quebec's far north, Kujuac was Canada's hotspot on Tuesday with a record-breaking temperature of 34 degrees Celsius. The average this time of year, just 16. Heat warnings now extend coast to coast, including parts of BC, Atlantic Canada and the Northwest Territories. We're seeing climate change unfold in front of our eyes. Moving forward, we're going to have more years with extreme heat than we will with sort of more, more moderate kinds of summers. That staggering heat in northern Quebec contributing to a soaring global average temperature of 17 degrees, breaking records two days in a row. We're pushing our ecosystems and our climate into a different place uh, than it's been for the entirety of human civilization. And that is alarming. I think it confirms the Those who help people reduce climate risks say Canadians need to better prepare. The problem is that we still have a cold climate mentality in Canada. We haven't really kind of adapted urgently to extreme heat yet. As the planet faces scorching conditions, the global weather pattern El Nino has returned. A natural warming of the central Pacific typically every two to seven years that rises into the atmosphere, generally making it hotter. The fact that we're continuing to uh, uh, be experiencing global warming, the El Nino has the uh, uh, an enhanced probability of triggering or producing more extreme weather. El Nino affects Canada the most during the winter and spring more extreme rainfall events in BC, and then next winter uh, we'll probably have a mild winter. Which can still produce dangerous conditions like Quebec's devastating ice storm of 1998, which occurred in an El Nino year. Scientists say this is the first time an El Nino has occurred on top of so much human-caused warming, meaning it's playing out in uncharted waters. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto.
Advancements in DNA technology have helped Ontario police crack a cold case dating back nearly half a century. And the victim, known until now as Nation River Lady, whose remains were found in the waters east of Ottawa, has finally been identified. CTV's Adrian Gobriel has the intriguing details. Hopefully it will For decades, it's been a mystery that sparked national headlines. Over the years, her looks have changed in the police sketches. The cold case leading to this 2010 investigation by CTV's W5. She was uh, somebody's uh, daughter, somebody's wife. Known only as the Nation River Lady, her true identity was buried here at this Toronto cemetery until recently. In late 2019, we decided in consultation with the chief coroner and members of the Centre of Forensic Science in Toronto to exhume the, the body of the victims to obtain a new DNA profile. The Ontario Provincial Police then approached a non-profit organization who uploaded the DNA sample to genealogical websites. Within a few weeks, we were able to trace the relatives, the DNA relatives. In 2020, police identified the Nation River Lady as Jewel Parchman Langford, a prominent 48-year-old businesswoman from Tennessee who'd gone missing in 1975, just one month after moving to Montreal. Until now, authorities kept their discovery a secret as they worked with the FBI to identify a suspect. 81-year-old Rodney Nichols, who knew Langford, has since been arrested in Florida. This goes to show that conventional methods used to try to identify this person were never going to work. Cold cases are, are, are really at uh, the, the pinnacle of, of, of technology in terms of uh, what we can do with them now. Long ago, Langford's family had this plaque installed at a cemetery in Jackson, Tennessee. It read, missing, but not forgotten. With her body now back in the United States, it's been laid to rest under a new headstone that says, finally home and at peace. Police believe that in 2020, this became the first investigation in Canadian history to identify human remains through forensic genealogy. As for the 81-year-old accused, a request has been made to have him extradited from the U.S. back to Canada. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. People gathered in the West Bank today surveying the damage and mourning the dead after the most intense Israeli military operation in nearly two decades. The two-day raid on Janine forced thousands from their homes and left 12 Palestinians dead. Today, mass funerals drew huge crowds. Israel says its goal was to destroy and confiscate weapons. An Israeli soldier was also killed. Thousands of Israelis blocked the main highway in Tel Aviv today in a protest after the resignation of the city's popular police chief, who said he was leaving under political pressure. Police used water cannon to try and push back the crowds. In a first-of-its-kind case here in Canada, the RCMP have charged an Ottawa man with terrorism and hate propaganda offenses. Police say 26-year-old Patrick Gordon McDonald was allegedly connected to a U.S.-based neo-Nazi organization that calls itself the Adam Waffen Division. Another individual was also arrested but has not been charged. Tomorrow will mark a decade since one of Canada's deadliest rail disasters. The crash killed 47 people in Lac Mégantic, a town of just 6,000. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin is there tonight and takes a look at the grief and what's changed 10 years later. The church in Lac Mégantic opened its doors today, offering solace as the town prepared for a vigil at 1.14 a.m. At the exact time a runaway train barreled through town at more than 105 kilometers an hour, jumped the track, spilled much of its load of crude oil, sparking a blast that ripped a giant hole through the heart of town. Flames, RJ, are uh, 200 feet high. It's incredible. You can't believe it here. First responders could do little to save lives. I remember saying, if there's hell, it's like that. Smile. Jean Clusio's eldest daughter, Ketsy, was among the 47 killed. Is it easier with time? Has time, has 10 years? You can't erase it. Most who died were enjoying a summer night at the popular local bar, Musique Café. It was destroyed along with half of the downtown buildings. Over the past decade, most of that has been replaced by modern buildings. But the scars are still in plain sight. A train still travels through the town built by the tracks four times a day. That, despite promises of quick action from the federal and provincial governments for a bypass. 
the bypass has faced opposition among critics, owners of the land in the path of the new line. The Boulanger family farm will be cut in half. One thing you have to remember is the accident happened because of negligence. It's not the track of the railroad that made the accident happen. It was the way they used it. Ottawa recently announced work is to begin on the bypass in the fall, a relief to those who say they still shudder every time the train crosses. The tragedy spurred safety changes for the rail industry. More inspections, better oversight of handbrakes, phasing out of old tanker cars, reduced speeds. An average of four train accidents involving hazardous materials happen each year in Canada. And those marking the anniversary here say it's crucial to apply the lessons of that day in memory of those lost. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Lac Mégantic, Quebec. Canada and three other countries have taken Iran to the United Nations' highest court after their citizens were killed in a plane crash in 2020. The Ukraine Airlines flight from Tehran to Kyiv was shot down soon after takeoff, killing all 176 passengers on board, including 55 Canadians. The four countries accuse Iran of illegally taking the jet down and holding what they call a sham trial. Tehran says it was an accident. Time for a break, but when we come back, sharks near the shore, the facts and the fear, plus cocaine at the White House, the discovery and a deepening investigation. A small bag of cocaine found in a cubby inside the White House has prompted an investigation by the Secret Service. Where this was discovered uh, is a heavily traveled area. The white powder was located Sunday night in a common area of the West Wing, where staff and visitors store personal belongings, such as cell phones. The bag is undergoing further testing for fingerprints or DNA. Shark sightings on American shores are prompting new warnings about dangers in the water. There have been at least five attacks in the last two days. Here's CTV's Joy Melvin. The images look straight out of Hollywood, weaving in and around these swimmers a shark in the shallow waters of Pensacola, Florida. Horrified, people were yelling, If it feels like shark encounters are rising, they actually are in New York. This drone video shows more than 50 sharks lurking off the coast. Beaches are on high alert, prompting more patrols and warnings on the shores, scouting for danger. After at least five suspected shark attacks on Long Island, a teenage surfer bit in the foot. My first reaction to when the shark grabbed my foot was to immediately get out the water. Another teenager, two men in their 40s and a woman, all treated for bites to the hand, knee and thigh. There were more shark bites in New York State than in any year ever recorded. It's random. It changes from year to year. And so that's part of what makes them so scary. Magnolia Woodward was swimming at Florida's Cocoa Beach when a shark took a bite of her. 50 stitches later... I pushed it away because I knew that it hurt. It hurt so bad. And this chilling video. A hammerhead shark seems to stalk Malia Tribble, paddleboarding from the Bahamas to Florida. And while these videos are absolutely terrifying, unprovoked shark attacks are still very rare. Scientists say they're drawn closer to the shore, hunting for fish or seals, and humans aren't really on the menu. The shark isn't hunting you, it just made a mistake. Little comfort for beachgoers. I don't go more than up to my waist because of all the sharks, because I'm afraid. With shark sightings and panic on the rise, the best advice, say experts, stay alert. Don't swim alone or at night. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. Still ahead, Adele's warning. Dang. The singer's plea for better behavior at concerts. Environmental activist Greta Thunberg has been charged with disobeying a police order after she refused to leave a climate protest last month. She was detained along with other activists for stopping traffic at the Malmö port oil terminal in Sweden. If convicted, the 20-year-old could be fined or face up to six months in prison. Her trial is scheduled for the end of the month. Two months after Charles's coronation, there was a grand ceremony in Scotland today for the new king. 
By the symbol of this sword, we pledge our loyalty. The monarch was presented with the scepter, the sword of state, and the Scottish crown jewels. But the day was not only about pledging loyalty to the throne. Protesters chanting, not my king, lined the route leading to St. Giles Cathedral, where the Scottish ceremony was held. And the recent trend of fans going too far at concerts with bad behavior has hit a sour note with Adele. Have you noticed how people are like forgetting show etiquette at the moment? People are throwing on stage. Have you seen that? Dare you? Dare you throw something at me? I'm fing you. The warning was from the British singer at her recent concert in Las Vegas while shooting t-shirts towards the audience. It comes on the heels of attacks on artists like Kelsey Ballerini and Bibi Rexa, who had items thrown at them while performing on stage. After the break, from Pine to Prairie, the relic ride-along rolling across Manitoba. Long drives into lazy sunsets are what summer is all about. And for a group of car enthusiasts, it's both a passion and a project. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Jill Makishan on their recent adventure along the old Trans-Canada Highway route in a caravan of classic cars. It's a road trip back in time <laughs> for five antique car enthusiasts who are taking these old Fords on the highway again, hitting maximum speeds of 55 kilometers per hour. So, you know, when you're driving something like this, you, you can't be in a hurry. You have to be appreciative of the machine. Machines dating back to the 30s and one Ford Model T from 1923. A caravan with a hundred years of history. Following a dusty stretch of road through Manitoba, the old Trans-Canada Highway from the Ontario border to Saskatchewan. I mean, people might look at this road and go, this is the Trans-Canada Highway? Yes. Back when it was first uh, established, it wasn't the paved multi-lane highway we know today. It was pretty primitive by modern standards. And these cars, though technical marvels of their time, were missing a few extras, like side windows and windshield wipers. Basically all it is is you reach out with a cloth and try to wipe the windshield off the best you can with a cloth. You know, like the modern amenities we've come quite accustomed to in cars just didn't exist in cars of this age. The antiques are gaining a lot of attention and the drivers are bringing in donations for another historic car. The tree planting car, which once ran the rails a century ago, educating prairie farmers on the importance of reforestation. For these drivers, their prairie journey is now at an end. A three-day tour spanning 545 kilometers, showing that these relics are still reliable. Jill Mackishon, CTV News, Winnipeg. Quite the journey. That's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night. National News, Canada's number one newscast.